Να πω ότι τώρα θα αλλάξουμε λίγο το κανάλι. Το ελληνικό θα μεταφερθεί στο αγγλικό πρόγραμμα. Θα παρουσιάσουμε διαφάνειες. Ο κύριος Χρυσοχώος είναι μαζί μας σήμερα. Πριν από αυτό να πω ότι εκ μέρους του PTA του Γουλίαμ Σπυρόπουλος έχουμε τη χαρά να έχουμε την Αλεξία Κοντογιάννη μαζί μας η οποία εκπροσωπεί την Πρόεδρο, την Εμιλιάνα, την Σιδεράκη. Επίσης να πω ξανά για το βιογραφικό α, των ομιλητών μας. Α, δεν ξέρω πώς ακούστηκα πριν, απλά να πω αν δεν σας πειράζει για οικονομία χρόνου, σας παρακαλούμε, μπορείτε να το διαβάσετε στο πρόγραμμα. Μια σειρά από διαφάνειες λοιπόν έχει ετοιμάσει για σήμερα ο Βασίλης Χρυσοχώος, ιστορικός και μουσικοσυνθέτης, μέλος του Ελληνικού Πολιτιστικού Οργανισμού, με βαθιά γνώση της βυζαντινής ιστορίας και του ελληνικού πολιτισμού. Με τη βοήθεια της τεχνολογίας θα μας ταξιδέψει σε τόπους αγαπημένους. Τον καλωσορίζουμε στο βήμα. Uh, many people throughout the decades have always asked me, what is this Macedonia issue? Uh, can you explain to me why you Greeks care about this uh, country and why won't you leave them alone? Or Greeks just ask, uh, can you explain to us why is it important for us? What is Macedonia? What does this mean? What is this state? And I always tell them, this is a very complicated uh, political uh, sociological issue that you cannot explain in two minutes. You, you gotta go back to the very, very beginning, and you have to understand why Macedonia is important in Greece's history. It it's basically takes more than half of Greece's history, and to understand why it's important to us and to the world, we have to travel back. And eight hours later, a lot of wine, you know, explain to them the modern issues that uh, Mrs. Levani has explained before. I'm not going to dwell into that. I'm going to take you back to the past, to how Macedonia starts, through ancient Greece into uh, the Middle Ages and to the modern times. So, Macedonia through the ages, it's Greece's indomitable force of Hellenism. Macedonia was a shield of Greece. In the north, where this is northern Greece, the Persians, the Turks, they all will go through Macedonia, and Epidos and Thrace, but as you will see, the theme of Macedonia or the province is always the most important in northern Greece. And that is a quote from Strabo that says, Estim un elas que Macedonia. Macedonia is also Greece. Strabo was a famous Greek geographer that we rely on uh, for a lot of the history these days in geography of the ancient world. He lived in the Roman, uh, during the Roman era. And uh, he was one of the, the main people that lived through the Hellenistic Age and the transitional period to the Roman uh, Empire. And this is in various languages explaining from back then that Greece is also Macedonia. What is the role of Macedonia through Greece's history? Well, I'm going to explain very briefly. There is the founding of the ancient kingdom of Macedonia. There's Alexander the Great and his empire. I always like to stress Cleopatra. She's a very uh, famous woman that nobody knows. She's Greek. She was the Greek queen of Egypt and she's the last one of Alexander's descendants. I'm Macedonian from a very famous dynasty. Uh, then we're gonna go into St. Paul's journeys throughout Northern Greece. We read the Bible, Philippi, you know, all these places that St. Paul traveled is in Macedonia. And it's very important, he had a vision, a dream that came to him to go to, from a tall Macedonian man to come to Greece and preach the gospel. And there's a reason why this happens. And then we go into something I don't think many people know about this Antium had a Macedonian dynasty. In fact, it was the Macedonian Renaissance that we experienced about over a decade ago at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, the, golden, uh, the golden age of Greece that brought together all the countries that were under the influence of, of medieval Greece, Byzantium, and all the gold, the treasures, the icons came to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the Macedonian Renaissance is 200 years of the 1100 years of Byzantium history. And, of course, we come after the Greek Revolution to Pavlos Melas and the Macedonian Liberation Movement of the 20th century. We're going to mention a few words. I have some interesting pictures I was able to get right now. And this is a timeline. So, if we were to stress how far back Greece goes, it will need another, another row. 
our prehistory goes back to 9000 BC, then you have recorded history, Minoans, Mycenaeans, the Hellenic Age, the Pelasgians. Uh, Macedonia begins as a political entity in northern Greece around 700 BC. We're going to discuss in the next title, but you know, this classical Greece, then the age of Alexander the Great, that's Macedonia, 300 years ruling the known world. Then you go into Roman Greece, and then we're going to mention St. Paul uh, and the role of Macedonia during Roman times, and then Byzantine Greece. And of course, then we have the Ottoman Empire, the revolution, and the modern era, Pablo's Melas and the Balkan Wars, where we liberate Macedonia again. Uh, this is the ancient um, kingdom of Macedonia. The dynasty goes back to Heracles from the house of Argos. They were Dorians, the same as the Spartans. They started in the north, some went to the south like Sparta, some stayed up there. They are mentioned in the Trojan War, during Homer, but as a, as a, as a kingdom, uh, they start in 700 BC, we have uh, records, and with uh, the kingdom of Amintas become more numerous records about 500 uh, BC, and then with Philip II in uh, around the 4th century, that's when Macedonia becomes a superpower. Why is it different than the rest of the Greek world? And sometimes you hear uh, the Athenians were against the Macedonians, Demosthenes, the orator, called them barbarians. They were simply living in the era of Homer, in the Trojan War. There were kingdoms. All of northern Greece, Thrace, Epirus, Thessaly, and Macedonia were kingdoms. Southern Greece were city-states. They formed a different political system, voting, uh, you know, the Athenians had democracy, the oligarchy, there was a dual monarchy in Sparta. So the Nordic Greeks followed a more ancient route. They evolved a little bit differently. They had uh, large mountains and barriers, Mount Olympus and other mountains that were in their way. So they evolved kingdoms. That is the main difference. They all worshiped the same gods, they spoke the same language, and so forth. And the greatest uh, figure of the Macedonian dynasty is Philip II, not to be overlooked, but it's Alexander the Great, his son, that conquers the world and spreads Hellenism. So whatever the Athenians created, all the beautiful art, the, the age of Pericles, and the zone of democracy created uh, for, for in Athens, it's Alexander that spread, it, spread uh, Hellenism to the known world, up to India. Ah. So Macedonia expands, and you know, the northern Greece goes under Macedonia. So if you see real maps, which unfortunately they might change with all this that's happening now. In ancient times, northern Greece was called uh, Macedonia, and the southern will be called Achaia. Not, not Greece. That's actually the correct terminology. This is Alexander the Great's empire. He wanted to avenge Greece from the Persians that had for 200 years previously been invading Greece, and they were trying to uh, basically uh, make a gateway into the rest of Europe, and the Greeks were the ones that stopped them uh, with the Battle of Salamis, the Battle of Thermopylae, but they didn't defeat them. And Alexander the Great vowed to avenge, to defeat the Persians, and liberate the Ionian cities, which is uh, in modern-day Turkey now, on the coast of Asia Minor, uh, like Zvini, that's the Ionian coast. And that those were under the Persians, so it was Thrace. And the Persians were going down to Macedonia to take over Athens. So Alexander created the Panhellenic uh, Crusade that Philip, his father, actually had started and became the most successful general the world had ever known. In the beginning, never losing a battle, he built over 77 cities and reached from Egypt, the Caucasus, all the way to India, what is now modern Pakistan, that region. This is his empire, and then it was split into his four generals, and we have the Hellenistic Age. That's the age of the Greeks ruled the world in the ancient times. For 300 years, up until 1080, Aristotle, the famous Athenian philosopher, was actually Macedonian. He was born in Stagira in Halkidiki, in Macedonia. He uh, was invited by uh, Philip when he attracted the greatest minds of his time to train Alexander physically and spiritually and his mind. And Aristotle was his tutor that influenced him. And that's uh, from the Drachmas, from actually from Greece, uh, Aristotle and Alexander the Great. Uh, I used it to show you. And this is one of his uh, famous quotes. Tolerance and apathy are the last virtues 
of a dying society. Apathy, tolerance, let things just be. You know, you need to act and react. Cleopatra was one of the last descendants of Alexander the Great's Hellenistic age, and Cleopatra dies 30 AD, uh, one of the famous love stories with Mark Anthony. Uh, it's Cleopatra the seventh, Berenike the fourth. More women ruled in ancient Greece under the Ptolemies than anywhere else in the ancient times, which is never mentioned, especially by the Greeks. And they were 100% Greek Macedonians, because uh, frankly, unfortunately, they followed the incest uh, ritual of the Egyptians. It's, it's the only uh, uh, of the successor states of Alexander the Great that followed what the Egyptians did, and that was incest. So we know they never intermixed. They were Greek. And see, the seven Cleopatras, four Berenikes, Arsinoe, they were powerful women that are all hailed from their ancestry of Ptolemy, one of Alexander the Great's generals, and possibly relatives and cousins. So it's important to know that. Uh, this is the Hellenistic Age, it spans 356 BC to 10 AD. Cleopatra in the West is the last uh, of, the, of the Hellenistic queens, and we usually say the Hellenistic Age ends at 30 BC, but there is more, I'll show you in a second. This is Greece's first Macedonian dynasty and a global empire, and it goes all the way to India. And there was a Greek Bactrian kingdom, that's, uh, that's a state now in what is Afghanistan. There was an Indo-Greek kingdom that was not out of Macedonians, it was made out of the other Greeks that fought in a war that conquered northern Greece and were, uh, uh, lived at the same time as the first in Indian king, Gupta, who was uh, Ahsoka's <laughs> grandfather. And uh, we have the, the last King Menander that dies, in, it's 1080, the official ending of the Hellenistic Age in the East. So we had Greek kings that ruled northern India for hundreds of years. They influenced Buddhism in what is now called the Gandahara region in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, if you go to the Metropolitan Museum or any, any museum, you will see statues of early Buddha as Heracles or, or Apollo because they had no images before the Greeks to uh, show Buddha. What happened in the East though, the Greeks even themselves forgot because the Persians resurrected again under a new empire called the Parthian and they forgot about those Greeks in India. But in the meantime, Alexander and the Hellenistic world had created a synergy, and new ideas evolved, and it helped spread the religion of Jesus Christ when he, was, uh, when he came upon the world. And St. Paul, his apostle, was able to preach in Greek, the Kimi, that's the common language of the era that Alexander heralded, the Gospel of Jesus. Uh, in fact, the Old Testament was translated into Greek which we call the Septuagint, under Ptolemy, uh, Cleopatra's ancestor, and the New Testament was written in Greek by the apostles who basically understood Greek and thought in Greek. So it was natural that he, his trips ended up going to northern Greece. That's, that's where St. Paul preached in uh, Neapolis, which is modern-day Kavala, and Philippi, Amphipolis. We hear a lot about Amphipolis, that's where Alexander started the expedition to the east. This is the memorial tomb uh, that was discovered and silenced by the Greek government for many years because it will upset the neighbors. That's a whole other issue. But he preached there on his way to Apollonia, Thessaloniki, and Veria, as you can see. So Macedonia was very crucial. Under the Roman Empire, the Latin Roman Empire, because it's also an Eastern Greek Empire, uh, that's the Eastern half, this is the beginning though, uh, when Diocletian sp splits the empire into two. The Diocese of Macedonia basically takes all of Greece and Thrace and Dacia. Uh, that's how important Macedonia is, even under the administration of the, of the Romans, it was basically called all of Greece. Then it becomes a theme, it's, it's always kind of moving with Thrace, these are Greek areas that have different meaning and they are actually uh, used for administrative purposes to describe the whole nation. Uh, and Constantine the Great, this is a, a special coin that comes from the, uh, numis, uh, the, the coin museum in Athens, the numismat, uh, Numismatica Museum of, uh, of Athens. This is a coin of Constantine the Great and Alexander the Great behind him. He used to be symbolized as Apollo, as a sun god. Um, and this is a gold solidus of the 4th century, and basically it, it, it symbolizes the unbroken continuity of the Greco-Roman world. Constantine was also of Greek descent, 
but he followed Alexander the Great's uh, mission to unite the empire and make move the Roman Empire to the east in Byzantium and rename it Constantinople. And he will become the first Christian emperor. This begins the 1100 year reign of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, give or take some years, uh, usually it's with the founding of Constantinople in 330 AD. And the fall of Constantinople is in 1453, but Trabizond, the last uh, kingdom, is in 1461, a false of the Turks. And that's a, Greece's second global empire. It's a multicultural empire, just as the Hellenistic was, but it was a Greek Christian multicultural empire. This is something we need to emphasize. The Greeks were not just a part of it. They were a nucleus, and if you were Armenian, Assyrian, Arab, Slav, you still had a Greek nucleus. And that's what ruled. And the Justinian the Great, He's also a saint. Uh, in our church, here he conquers uh, the, the lost western lands of the Latin Roman Empire for the Greek East. This is the map. This is the extent of the Byzantine Empire at its height in the 6th century. And then since we're talking about the Macedonian dynasty, uh, we move on to the 9th century. For 200 years, there is a dynasty, the Basil of Macedonia, a peasant from the north Greece of the theme of Macedonia forms a new dynasty where a lot of these names, he, he rewrites the, the laws of Justinian uh, until the Basilica, this becomes the legal code for, for the world, you know, for Western world. All the, in, in Greek, his son Leo VI, the Sophos, finishes his project. You have other names that you might have heard in school, John Timisky's Orange Street in Thessaloniki, Timisky Street, uh, Nikiforos Volkas is a famous general emperor's that took back Cyprus and Crete and other parts of lands that were lost to the Arabs. Um, Zoe and Theodora, two famous empresses that are in the in the Sophia, there are frescoes. So, the most famous one, of course, is Basil II Porfirogenitos, which is uh, a descendant of Basil I, and he's the one that extends the empire at its height. This is uh, one of my designs inspired by Basil II, based on the manuscript. If you know Penelope Delta, if you grew up with a famous Greek uh, children's author, who becomes very important in the struggle for Macedonia and the Macedonian struggle, she wrote a lot of books, and they were patriotic books. And one of them was Stokirotu Varoktonu, in the heroic age of Basil II of Byzantium, and the Patrida for the motherland. Um, so this is the Macedonian dynasty under Basil II, uh, the empire at its height. It takes back southern Italy. You know, it's kind of like what we envisioned the Greek uh, modern Greek empire was uh, once it was more confined to Asia Minor and the Balkans. Um, uh, this is Methodius and Kyrillos, a stand from the Greek government. These are the two saints from Thessaloniki that were sent under Basil the Macedonian and Michael III, the, the, the emperor before him, the Amorian dynasty, to apostolize eventually the Slavs. And this is the greatest contribution that the Macedonian dynasty did. Uh, the two Greek monks of Thessaloniki were able to uh, translate and create an alphabet for the Slavs uh, into their own language, the Glacolithic alphabet. Uh, that's why it's uh, Serbian, uh, Russian, Bulgarian, it's called Cyrillic, it, it looks Greek. It has some Greek characters that were created by the monks and their followers. So, just like St. Paul was the apostle to the Greeks, Methodius and Kyrillos, two Macedonian monks from Saloniki were the apostles to the Slavs. And that includes Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and all the Balkan Slavs that follow the Orthodox faith to this day, and the Catholic faith, if they still write it. In the Middle Ages now, Alexander the Great became not just a historical figure, he became now a legend and a mythological figure. Alexander the Great will travel the world, go into submarines, fight monsters. He never died. And his legend is called the Alexander Romance, um, or the Legend of Alexander, and it was translated in over 17 languages in the Middle Ages. And in uh, Byzantium, this is from my book, uh, the Venice Hellenic Institute Codex GR5, this is the most, the Greek uh, Alexander Romance. He becomes a Byzantine emperor, a philosopher king, 
as we know of him from uh, from history, Arian and Plutarch tells us he was trained by Aristotle, he was benevolent to women, he was wise, and that is the, the, some of the true characteristics of Alexander the Great that are now lost, because they call him a warrior king, this and that, a butcher, this is like, this is modern, modern political propaganda, but that's not how, the way it was. After the, the Bible, the Old and New Testament, and the books of the fathers, you learn the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the legend of Alexander. This was for a thousand years, up basically up until the time of Columbus, and, uh, and even later. So this is how strong Macedonia and Alexander the Great was in Byzantium and in the West. King Arthur, the Knights, they all trace back to Alexander the Great and this legend. They have their own version. Uh, after the Turks and uh, the fall, unfortunately, of Constantinople, weak and the liberation in 1821, uh, there's a large part of Greece that was not liberated in 1821, in 1832 when the Kingdom of Greece was, uh, was formed, the Northern Greece, it was still under the Ottoman Empire. And uh, the, the chunk of it, Macedonia, and Ibidos, Thrace, and Thessaly will be taken back slowly. But at the same time, there were other national, uh, nationalist movements that uh, arose in the, in, the, in the Balkans, the Bulgarians, People that had kingdoms in the Middle Ages, we all cross paths, uh, path, but we were all Orthodox, they had a national awakening, and they wanted to get back their lost lands as well. And some, for, and, and some had to do with uh, Northern Macedonia, which was not part of the historic Greek one, but it was part of a region called Macedonia, the theme in uh, what is Skopje now, that, that region in Bulgaria. Because the Bulgarians, when they became Christianized, it was in this part of northern, northern Macedonia. So to them, that was a very sacred place. And uh, Bitola, Ofrit, and they wanted to recapture it. That's why we say it's a very complicated theme. It goes back a thousand years. It's not just because Macedonia is Greek. The history is, but there's a region that also the Slavs and the Bulgarians became Christian and started their own Slavic identity in this part of uh, Macedonia, but it wasn't the, the one of, of the old times. Um, so the, the Greeks under Pavlos Melas, that's a stand from the Greek government, and this is Iondra Gumis, there were two Macedonomachi, Macedonian fighters, that started this movement. In order to strengthen Greek effort from Macedonia, the Hellenic Macedonian Committee was formed in 1903 under the leadership of a, a wealthy publisher called Dimitris Kalapothakis, and its members included the Ionotra Gurmis and Pavlos Melas. I mentioned Benelope Delta earlier because she was involved in the Macedonian struggle, and she was very, uh, very good friends with the Ionotra Gurmis, uh, Benakis, who, who, you know, we know the Benaki Museum, and these people that were the foundation of early Greece, and they all fought for Macedonia and for Epiros and for Thrace, and these are the two uh, co-founders. So, the very fabric of modern Greece, even in the 20th century, has to do with Macedonia and how to liberate it from the Ottoman Turks. And also before the Bulgarians get there. Uh, this is the seal of the Macedonian Committee depicting Alexander the Great and Basil II, the Bulgar Slayer. This is Basil, this is Alexander. That's why I mentioned everything has a link. The people that fought, they knew their past. They knew their history. And they knew there were an unbroken link in a chain. It's called the, the Hellenic tradition. They did not come out of the blue. They were descendants of these people. And as land shifts, you know, it moves, there were still people that believed and they knew where they were from. And this is the, the aim of the Macedonian Committee was to liberate it from the Ottoman Empire. This, actually, I happened to be in Greece uh, this week, and uh, I met the director of the National, uh, National Historic Museum. Uh, allow me to take a few pictures. This is Pavlos Melas. This is uh, my picture from the original oil painting, Bajia Kovidis. Uh, and these are his weapons and belongings. If you go to the National Historic Museum, the Fnico Historico Museo, you need to visit it. It's uh, the old Vuli, the old parliament, before it became the new one. It's by the Athens Dimarchio, 
uh, the mayor's uh, uh, municipality uh, department. And um, it has all the revolutionary heroes, all of 1821, the statues, the original paintings, uh, the war, uh, the weapons, the flags, the Feria Ithanatos, Bubulina's outfits, Pablo's Melas, World War II, Balkan Wars, everything's included, Byzantium. Uh, this is, so, this is a painting of Macedonian fighters uh, in the 1878 revolt in Thessaly, Macedonia, and Epiros. Uh, this had failed, but the struggle continued. In the 1890s and in 1903, these are pictures uh, of some of the fighters, and the priest, of course, is in the middle, and all the other fighters. How did this happen? I'm not gonna, I can't get into details, but the Bulgarians had a campaign that in, the, in what is now Northern Greece to people that spoke Slavic, the people were mixed at the time with their languages. And they, before this notion of nationality, everybody was first Christian, Orthodox. So a lot of people spoke different dialects. Um, the, the Bulgarians tried to, whoever spoke Bulgarian or Slavic dialect, say these are Bulgarians and this Macedonia is ours, we're gonna take those villages. And there was pillaging, and looting, and a, lot, and a lot of atrocities that were done. And the Greeks were trying to reclaim Thessaloniki, which was not part of Greece, the Greek kingdom or the Hellenic Republic. Uh, and they were trying to get Thessaloniki and whatever they could from northern Greece before the Bulgarians and, and the Serbians were going down to get uh, land. It was, everybody needed access to the sea. And Thessaloniki was the Aegean that was very important. It was a key port from Ottoman times up until now. Of course, Byzantine times, it was the second capital. Uh, that's me with Kolokotronis in the front, that's the parliament, the old parliament building, that's the museum inside, and then it has different, uh, this is from the website, it has different uh, rooms where all the, where the heroes are, the paintings. So finally, um, Macedonia is liberated. This is Greece at the time of 1912. In 1832, it was only up to there that we get Thessaly, uh, some of the islands, the Ionians, uh, the Cyclades, but no, the Greece was still Ottoman. So, in the, the, the Greece, Serbia, Montenegro, and Bulgaria in 1912, before World War I, were fighting to get rid of the Turks and liberate their, their countries in the Balkans, get them out of the Balkans, and they all united. Um, it's just that we're also all going for, for Thessaloniki. So the Greek army reached Thessaloniki about two hours before the Serbian army and then the Bulgarian army. That's how we got. That's why we have it. Um, so there was a lot of a lot of um, a great effort to liberate northern Greece because at the same time the Ottomans and the were going through upheavals. The young Turks were rebelling. This is a new uh, movement that happened in the Ottoman Empire at that time. And there was a moment of weakness that we were able to, to get back some more lands. That, doesn't mean, that means a lot of Greeks were still out of what is Greece now, in Asia Minor and Kusaninopo. Uh, but Macedonia and Epirus were liberated in 1912. That's a, it's a poster of the, of the era. You can see Macedonia right in here, Epirus, and that's a liberated Greece. So even though Greece was liberated in 1821, Macedonia didn't, and Northern Greece didn't get in, into uh, its borders until 1912. Uh, the, uh, the islands uh, in, in the Aegean were, in, 1940, in 1947, uh, they were occupied by, by Italy, the Dodecanese. Uh, anyway. uh, to get to, to speed it up, uh, then comes World War II. After World War I, we, we still have wars, we have to, we try to reclaim um, Zmirny and Kusadinopol, and it, it fails, uh, that's, that's a whole other story, and it is the great catastrophe. And then we have World War II, and the civil war against the communists, uh, under Tito. Uh, Tito makes an alliance in the beginning with Stalin, and they want to invade and create a new entity in Northern Greece, and restart this, this uh, project the Bulgarians had started of Macedonia. Because it was the Bulgarians that originally wanted to create an independent state in Northern Greece, Macedonia, uh, and then take it over, then it became independent. They had two, two different civil wars, I mean two different movements. One wanted to be independent Macedonian, but Bulgarian, and the other one wanted to be one with Bulgaria eventually. That failed, but Tito 
the Yugoslav communist, Soviet communist uh, leader uh, made it a reality actually with the uh, Greek Bolsheviks and basically planned to take the Saloniki and create uh, a new entity, this is Macedonia. And this is the map in 1992 when uh, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia declared independence, when Yugoslavia disbanded after the fall of communism, and they claimed all of what they call the Aegean Macedonia, Pirin, that's Bulgaria, and uh, I, I guess the, the Vardar Macedonia. That's what a little simple map of what's happening right now. So this issue has been going on since 1992. It goes back 100 years with the Bulgarians in uh, 1898, with the Macedonian struggle. Although that fails, it continues on the Tito, and this is the remnants we have to deal with. Those people that are also our Orthodox uh, brethren, unfortunately, they grew up in the 40s, uh, believing and, and being taught in their schools in the, in the communist system of Yugoslavia. They are Macedonians. And our Greek governments did know there was a Macedonia across uh, this Republic of Macedonia, and it did nothing. Uh, but when it broke up, this, this nation broke up, and NATO wanted to expand into Europe and uh, kind of uh, avert Russia's influence in the Orthodox world, they wanted to create a problem for Greece and in the Balkans and create this entity now. And this is what we have. We have now the Greek government uh, recognize the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, an issue that should not have been an issue. It didn't need to be resolved. It's only a couple million people. We could just let it be. But they gave him, they claim they didn't, but they, in essence they gave him a nationality and a language. Because if, you, if you're a Korean, and if you're from the North or the South, you're still Korean. And what are these people going to be? What's going to happen to Northern Greece? As Mr. Livani explained to us in, 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 the, in the Greek uh, lecture. So, this is the Greek region of Macedonia in yellow, the capital of Thessaloniki. Uh, this is kind of a, sort of what the ancient uh, boundaries were, because we have a, a region in also Skopje that, that the Greeks, indigenous Greeks live, Monastiri, and a lot of Greek communists that were exiled in, after the Greek civil war from the Greek government, and they could never come back because they uh, conspired to kill and take over northern Greece. And, and these are the descendants now, those Greek communists from Skopje that are allying with the Slavs of the area that want to come back. So, and this is the, the former Yugoslav Republic of, of Macedonia, now called Northern, North Macedonia. So, as, as you saw throughout the, the quick presentation, I hope I didn't bore you, uh, you understand Macedonia is very important to Greece's history. And when you see this now, and you're going to be seeing this in the history books and everywhere else, what are people going to think? How confused are they going to be? And when they're reprogramming people in Greece itself to give up their heritage, how is this going to be on our children? So, as I said, there's people in there that, that do uh, like us and we need to cooperate with them. They're also fellow Christians. And there's people, and then we have to educate them and ourselves and everybody else about the, the historical role of Macedonia. Uh, that's in a nutshell. This is what I, uh, I also do. Uh, music uh, with the themes of Macedonia, ancient and medieval, with mythology. I have, uh, this is our new album. Uh, I, we blend folk music with Greek music. I did a rock opera in Carnegie Hall, set in the year 988, in the time of Basil II. It, it has a story of Anna Porfirogenita, his sister, that married Vladimir the Great of Russia who converted his country. This is their love story. We did Carnegie Hall on Broadway, and now we're doing a smaller concert about the legend of Alexander the Great, his legends in the Old Testament, in Egypt, in the Byzantium and all that. So if anybody's interested, you can reach me after. But that in a nutshell is the role of Macedonia, Greece's indomitable force of Hellenism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vasily. That was wonderful. Nasi kala, Vasily. First to meet Irma. Na po e tisis oti e kumet in kiri alitai ki mazi mazi o pia in e tisis melos tu e niko politistik organizmo skinantasmas. Kio e tisis e kumet in kiri alitai ki mazi mazi o pia in e tisis melos tu e niko politistik organizmo skinantasmas. Kio e tisis e kumet in kiri alitai ki mazi mazi o pia in e tisis melos tu e niko politistik organizmo skinantasmas.
Ο πρωτοπρεσβύτερος Παύλος Καλαστίδης, ιερατικός προϊστάμενος της κοινότητάς μας πάνω από 20 χρόνια, τώρα 22 τον αριθμό, κρατά στη βαρά το πιδάλιο της μοναδικής αυτής σε μεγαλείο και ελληνοπρέπεια κοινότητα στο Αγίου Νικολάου. Το έργο του αξιοζήλευτο, η προσφορά του μεγάλη. Είναι ο δικός μας, ο στιβαρός, ο νουνεχής και προσινής πατήρ Παύλος. Είναι τιμή μου και ευλογία να τον καλέσω στο βήμα για να μας μιλήσει για το σκοπό, για την αποστολή του ελληνικού πολιτιστικού οργανισμού αφού δική του ήταν η έπνευση και το όραμα της πραγμάτωσής του. I want to take this opportunity to thank all the presenters this evening and most importantly to thank His Eminence Archbishop Dimitrios. I don't know if he knew that he would be coming to the first presentation of this newly organized group. I don't think he did, but I think it was divine providence that brought him here today so that he could bless this endeavor and so that it can become successful. Our purpose um, and mission is very um, clear. It's written in the uh, brochure that you can read. I would um, want to say that um, we are not people that only give to society, but we also look and we receive. And so this idea of a Hellenic society here at St. Nicholas was something that I noticed with our Korean brothers and sisters. They have Korean societies and chapters throughout this area. They have managed and been able to receive um, recognition from educational sources so that when they offer a uh, presentation like this or a a, uh, a course, perhaps in a certain subject, um, these uh, courses are accredited and people can put them towards their uh, diplomas in school. And they have done an excellent job, Your Eminence, in uh, bringing forth to the public uh, knowledge their Korean history and, and culture in every aspect. And um, this is our ultimate goal, that we can establish this model here at St. Nicholas and perhaps can be imitated throughout the country so that we can uh, bring to uh, the forefront knowledge of Hellenism and our history both as, as, as Hellenes but also as Greek Orthodox Christians. We have so much to offer uh, to, to the world. I know that teachers in our public schools will go to the Korean society and take courses for their salary differentials. And, um, <laughs> and I say, well, why can't we do this? So it's not an original idea, Your Eminence. It's what I've seen in the area, and I felt it was something that we needed to imitate. So we're trying, we're, we're, we're speaking with the, um, the American College in, in Greece to see if we can get some accreditation, recognition, because we need a source, an educational source to accredit. And then we have so many people within the community and without the community that could offer courses um, in many, many different areas. So please pray for us as we strive this. And if you have any ideas or can help or would like to join um, the, the core committee, we surely would be open um, to this. But I thank so, so very much His Eminence for being here. And um, some of the things that were mentioned tonight can be debatable. Um, and. I remember when I was growing up, our parents would mortgage their homes in order to establish and give to the church and to the school. 
these things are not happening today. So we might think that the church is weak. The church simply reflects what's happening with all of us because we are the church. And if we look at the archdiocese as an institution and look at it as being weak, it is only because we are all weak in what we're doing as, as, as constituents of the body of Christ. We are not practicing good stewardship, are we? And so we need to look at ourselves first before we um, think, because that's a mistake, I believe. We need to first look at ourselves and what we are doing, and then we can come together and we can be very dynamic. Very dynamic. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.